We are now starting on a laser beam focus on scoping the coordinated global and regional assessments. The last discussion and, and the, all the discussion uh, throughout the day has been very broad based. It's been uh, really a lot about AGMIP in general. But what we are now doing is we're putting on, we're putting our laser beams on, right? And, and we want to see how can we all together with partners across uh, the world uh, really accomplish this very challenging tasks. So we are going to um, uh, do a tag teaming um, to describe a straw man approach. Now, admittedly, we did all this before our great discussion that we just had. So um, we'll, you know, as we go through the week, these things will begin to mesh. But these are the topics that we're going to cover. So, and it's going to start from very broad, then narrow down to like nitty gritty, what, what actually has to happen, and then um, uh, open up at the, towards the end to things like, well, how, how, how could we get organized? How do we have to organize ourselves? And who would the partners be? Uh, what is the funding strategy, of course? And then finally, and this is also very important to AGMIP, what are the benefits to participation? This is an awful lot of work, as, and as Gossam was saying about the volunteers who will be many, because it will be many more hours than any funding will be able to, of course, uh, cover. And, and something works if it's good for everybody who's part of it. So what are the benefits of participation? So we want to start this actually very broadly, and this is actually just uh, for, to share with you the principles and processes, and this is for AGMIP as a whole, just so that everybody knows we do have um, guidelines of how we work together in AGMIP. And these are, these are the principles and the process of how we work together. So the first is scientific integrity that we're focused on. We have a primary public good purpose. We are very clear with each other that if we have conflicts of interest or biases, um, we declare them to each other so that AGMIP operates with transparency. In terms of advocacy, the only thing we advocate for is good science, the best science. That's really it. We also, in the way that we do things, we have, uh, there's the concept of openness. Um, it's the use of development, actually just going back to one for a moment, the use and development, we endorse this, the use and development of open source, open access models, data, and methods. We know that not all groups are there yet, um, but we have that as a, as a primary objective. And following on from that, we have as much as possible open meetings, if someone or an open activities really not every meeting this one we had to cap at at the at uh, 40 between 40 and 45 people who are here but um, basically anybody who wants to be part of agmip can be part of agmip that's really what it's about um, and we're very very dedicated to fair and full attribution of all of the work when people come together, this many people come together to work together, there's a lot of attribution. In the two volume books that we published on our, um, on our work in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, Eric, there, right, there, over, there were over 200 authors in that, uh, in the, across all the chapters, the 16 chapters of the book. Um, and those intellectual contributions include data. As Jerry, you were mentioning some of the data issues. Providing data and providing a great data set is just as great as doing an analysis for a paper. And, um, and so AGMIP actually has started a data journal. Um, Sander Janssen, who is our co-lead of our IT team, has started um, a, a, a data journal um, for that in, in association with AGMIP. Um, as you can tell very much from everyone who's here, transdisciplinary integration and collaboration is, is a fundamental principle. 
Um, we're not about silos. We know that sometimes we have to go into breakout groups and uh, in our with our building blocks, um, but um, but we still we are dedicated to be communicating and working together across those uh, disciplinary um, boundaries. And then finally, this was something that so the, the last one is um, we got some great advice when we met at FAO um, a few years ago for the Global Workshop. And some of our steering group, that meeting, Jerry was there, uh, Dominique was our, our host um, there, and they said, Agmip, don't get too bureaucratic. <laughs> that just keep being very resilient and flexible. And so as we go forward to be planning our CGRA, you know, we don't want it to make it too bureaucratic and hard, you know, just like, oh, all these rules and everything. It's just, let, let, so we definitely want to want to keep going. It, so it's um, really, so we can retain that great spirit of, of flexibility that we have. So those are the principles and processes that will, that will underlie the coordinated global and regional assessment. So now let's turn to the assessment itself. So we did brainstorming with the planning committee and we did a brainstorm on major assessment questions. And so this is what the planning group came to after new, quite, 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 a few numer quite a few discussions. Um, so again, we'll, but, but, and when we come in, uh, after this whole presentation, these are the, and we've already had some question, uh, discussion about qu what would major assessment questions be. But there's an overarching one, and then four that, that uh, could be, uh, that, are, that we're putting on the table. So the overarching question is, how will climate change and climate change policies affect global and regional agricultural production and food security under low and high sustainable pathways, sustainability pathways. That's overarching, big, broad question. Then within that, there are four major themes that we're putting forward for discussion. The first one is about adaptation. What are the capabilities of and limits to adaptation? Here are the key topics of technology trends, which came up very much in the discussion this morning, versus specific adaptation strategies, uh, management, um, gen and of these, uh, where how, what, what are management strategies? To what, what about genetics, which has also come up? So the first question is about adaptation. Second one, other major climate change response. What are the effects of agricultural mitigation policies? Key topics here are the effects on land use. We had some discussion about forestry and uh, land and red, the, the role of red and the role of agriculture in red. Uh, effects on land use, effects on prices. What's up with biofuels? Very controversial topic. It has been uh, and uh, probably continues to be, I think. Um, as well as then soil carbon, that as, a, as also, and, and other mitigation policies as well. We just, we just pulled out a few. Question three is the very much correct, really putting out there that we are going to tackle how, how climate change will affect food security and nutrition. Here are the four main topics of, uh, of uh, food security, uh, availability, access, utilization, stability. How would we handle those? We've ha already started some discussion. Then the nutrition question um, maybe is, might be too broad. You know, again, this is we want to be scoping also what is it that we can actually do. And the final question is how will food policies affect future agricultural production and food security? And here's that, the role of agricultural policy, of food policies. Here's what's up with trade, ecosystem protection. These are some of the potential areas there. So these are the straw man questions up for discussion later on. So then we took those four, the four, the four detailed, more detailed questions and we made a concentric circle diagram, again, straw man. And one thing I kept saying to Al, I always, I've said, how many times have I said this to you, Alex? I said, I said we need a concentric circle diagram like CMIP. <laughs> <laughs> so here is the draft, here's the straw man of it. So clearly we have a core of a set of, scenario, a set of RCPs, SSPs, RAPs, that we would all do together at global and regional scales. We, of course, we have, to, we have to look at historical time periods to see, well, you know, yes, how well do these models do? 
and also then that's one of the ways we can start bringing in extreme events of, uh, that, that has been, have been experienced. And then of course the future without climate change, the future with in a low sustainability future and a, and a future with a, a sustainable future. Uh, so that's a, a potential core. And then what you can see arranged on the outside are two axes related to the four questions. One are the climate change policy responses, adaptation and mitigation. That's on the north-south axis. And then on the east-west axis are the, these new ones of the food security. Food policy, there's, that's not necessarily new. I think that's, we did that way back with, um, with Martin Parry uh, in, the, in some of the original studies. But this nexus of the food security and uh, food policy. And then we're not going to go into the details, but what we did was we, we put some potential examples of what could be some of the actual testing that we would do in simulation sets designed to answer these kinds of core questions, in which would, these would be specifying RCPs, SSPs, in particular the RAPs would be come into play there to, for example, high protein demand, high caloric demand, or what's up with intense biofuels, uh, or what would happen with high fuel prices, or in adaptation, testing different types of strategies. Um, time periods we put, so we have, here's our, our, um, uh, uh, our uh, factor there in terms of our design, and that we had some great discussion about um, really getting serious about putting near term into our, the near, the near term into, into our time periods. We'll f have to figure out how to do that, very challenging. Um, and then we would agree on output variables. So that's our concentric circles. Yes, please jump in. Does this work for me? Um, I just want to point out please some do. people who might not be as familiar with CMIP, uh, the idea of this concentric circle diagram is that in the middle are the scenarios that we would hope everybody could run. And then the ones around the outside are by interest and resources and motivation. So uh, the, the idea here is that we would have a certain set uh, that would be the focus of you know, the, the broadest number of participants uh, and then also allow usually kind of by interest to have various groups propose these outer ones and say we want to do it and we think we can get enough people to do it with us, that will be worthwhile. Right. Great. Alex, how does no climate change differ from historical? In the that future. Is some, that is something we will, Ken, you're, you're getting ahead of us. Uh, we're going to go through <laughs> one of Wait, wait, yeah. Um, so I think if you don't mind, maybe we can, if everyone please to keep on your questions, because we could, every slide we could probably take, oh, you know, at least a half an hour of discussions. Okay, so here's the straw man concentric circle diagram. India, just a clarification sure. question sure. and a follow-up to Alex. The other principle that CMIP promoted was that um, the, the scenarios or activities in the core, to some extent, should be the foundation on which these outer core oh, yes. activities go down. In other words, they didn't want to really create a whole bunch of new efforts on their own and create chaos in that. That's so right. the it's foundation has to be there for the outer core activities yes. in order to make sure that everybody is following the standards and mm -hmm. protocols and rigor analyses and assessment and so on and so forth. Yeah, and if, right. if I could address that just quickly before we move on. So uh, we're going to talk later about actually defining what these look like, but we also did share the idea that the outer ones would be probably paired with one in the middle with one thing different that would allow a comparison between the two. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. Yeah, good. And in some cases, the other ones may not even require new sets of simulations. They may just be new scenario construction ways of processing mm -hmm. data. And That's looking at data. particular outputs. <clears throat> yeah. Good. OK, so here's concentric circle core straw man framing. What are the building blocks that are available to actually carry this out? So the next one is a building block, um, a framing, a slide. So we basically have, across the top, uh, is the global scale. So we have global biophysical models, crop and livestock. We have talked to Mario Herrero, uh, who's a global, livest uh, global livestock modeler who has expressed interest. And 
global economic models, and we've heard from some of each of those. Then, at the, um, then we have, um, at the, in the lower row, we have the local and regional scale, and we have local crop and livestock models, and we have regional economic models. So these are the basic building blocks. And you can see we're starting to put arrows, and you, when we get to the protocol elements, we're going to give some examples of what those actual arrows could actually mean, entail. Um, in the middle, here we have our, here's our, very much our integrating framework of the RCPs, SSPs, and RAPs. And then to tie it all together, as, because IT did come up earlier, IT is extremely important to be managing all the input data sets, the output data sets, uh, the tool, tool bases the, that this would actually entail. So this is the framing of the so of, of uh, straw man framing of building blocks. So the next one is for people who have been at the global Agmet global workshops, you're going to recognize the next slide. We call this the Agmet pedal diagram, because uh, these are uh, a representation of most of the Agmet activities, and we've circled some that are particularly particularly germane to for contribution that could, we think could contribute to the CGRA. But we also don't want to, uh, you know, we're not ruling out any, any other of the activities. For example, we have a wonderful water resource team. It would be fantastic because water has come up that to uh, work with Jonathan Winter, who's at Dartmouth, who's the lead there, um, to figure out, you know, if there could be you know, something on water as well. But in particular, we have AGMIP global economic assessments, which you've uh, already heard some about. Um, we have the Ag Grid, we, we've heard, um, we've begun to hear about. Um, we have very detailed work on uh, uh, individual crops. You'll see the whole list, which I think is very important for the other crops. It's not just the big four, but it's or uh, it's a, yeah. It's that that we do have work on the others as well, and then we have really um, w uh, wonderful work as well on regional integrated assessments, and we're going to be hearing more about that um, in our panel um, regions. And then um, last but not least, the cross-cutting themes, um, which are. Um, Work there. Have, there have been there are teams within Agmip that work on uncertainty. That's the whole. And Linda Mearns, who many of you know from uh, NCAR, is is on that team um, on uncertainty, the use of ensembles to um, to characterize uh, model based uncertainty, um, aggregation and scaling. That um, Frank has um, uh, been um, a, a major leader on, and representative agricultural pathways. These are all elements. Um, in AGMIP that we've been working on in AGMIP for a long time. And then we have other ones that are in development, um, which also some of which have been mentioned and some of which we, you know, we want to develop and nurture to, be, to, to contribute as well. So that's the beginning part of it. And now we're going to turn to, all right, how, what would really go in to our draft protocols that we want to have a, an actual draft by the end of the week. So this is where I'm going to turn to these guys. And let's see, who's going to take driving questions? John. Um, right. So, well, one of the things we thought it would be useful for everybody to um, uh, hear about is, uh, so on the, in terms of the regional assessment work that we've been doing over the past three years and continuing for a couple more years uh, with uh, DFID support uh, and teams in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Um, and for, th for that work, you know, of the many uh, questions that, that could be uh, looked at in climate impact assessment, we have uh, sorted out these four key questions that really, it's actually uh, quite simple, um, both in sort of the near term and then moving ourselves into some point into the future, looking at uh, really two questions. One is climate impact and then the benefits of adaptation. 
Uh, and then, of course, one could combine those two things together and say, what is the net effect of impact plus adaptation? Um, and, uh, and so the first two questions are about impact in the, in the sort of current world, what would be if we impose climate change on today's world, and we refer to that often as climate sensitivity analysis, and then, of course, we, could, we can have, as, as we've been discussing, like with climate smart agriculture, we could be looking at changes in systems in today's world that could uh, work better under even today's climate, or, or if cli today's climate also, of course, is changing, and under extremes, those kinds of things, just like we've been discussing. But, of course, a key part of climate assessment is putting ourselves into the, the future world. Uh, and so this, this trend without climate change uh, is what we're using, a combination of the global shared socioeconomic pathways and the representative agricultural pathways, which uh, is adding more agricultural detail to that SSP work, uh, both at the global and regional scale, uh, to put ourselves out into that future world, um, and then to carry out our impact assessment and our adaptation analyses in that future world context. So that's, uh, that's how we've been doing it with our regional team so far in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, also a project I'm involved with in the U.S. Uh, but this is, so this is something where, uh, and in doing that, defining certain uh, scenarios, you know, like Cynthia mentioned, f what we're now proposing as a straw man proposal for this CGRA is this idea of sort of two basic scenario concepts. One is a sort of low sustainability development pathway into the future, one a sort of more sustainable or high sustainability. But of course, if you look at, and, and Brian will tell us more about this tomorrow morning when he talks about this, the new scenario framework, uh, there are uh, five major sort of global SSP reference scenarios that uh, cover more ground than, than just that, so, and have different aspects to them. So the key point is that we need to make a decision about which basic, you know, what is that core set of scenarios that we're going to do, and, and how are we going to combine them with RCPs and SSPs and the global and regional um, agricultural pathways. Uh, let's see, I think that's enough for that one, Cynthia. So, so I, I want to just, uh, so for example, in the, in the discussion of with no climate change, you, you would take into account um, massive urbanization over the next same period without climate change, all the major trend lines, and that's kind of built into some of the, the scenarios that already kind of exist based on other economic models and so forth. So that's kind of a given and then you're just basically deflecting the right. higher. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to keep this short. I think many people in the room are familiar with RCPs, but it's my job just to make sure. So RCPs stand for Representative Concentration Pathways. Uh, it's a way of looking at what the future will be uh, dependent on the types of greenhouse gas and other constituents we'll see in our atmosphere. So. The two kind of extremes that were used in SEMA 5 was this RCP 2.6 on the left here, which you can see the, the changing surface temperatures are much less than what you get in the more extreme scenario, the RCP 8.5, uh, where you get much larger climate changes around the world. So one of the core elements of anything we do in the future is it would have to have a defined RCP. Uh, this is one of the ways that we characterize the future that we're examining. Um, and this is, of course, uh, a lot of work has been done with this within the IPCC and CMIP, uh, so we'll be following their lead on that. Great, and I think John. <laughs> this is, it's also, this is the pop-up presentation. So, so, so part of my uh, job was then also just, again, kind of following this morning, sort of getting everybody common terminology. Uh, and, and again, tomorrow morning we'll hear much more about this. Um, but, so, R RCPs we heard about, the new scenario framework also includes, uh, if you look at that, that diagram, that matrix in the upper left hand there, um, also includes across the, the top a, a set of uh, reference pathways uh, for socioeconomic dimensions. Uh, the, the sort of prevailing terminology now for those is shared socioeconomic pathways, SSPs. Um, 
And the, those have then been uh, characterized in uh, five different sort of marker uh, cases, you might say. And Brian, I probably have an old version here with some of the old labels, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you can update us tomorrow, <laughs> yeah. Um, but the key point is, is to characterize um, socioeconomic challenges, characterize them in terms of two key dimensions, challenges for adaptation, challenges for mitigation. Uh, what we've been doing in AgMIP then is to take that and uh, say now for agricultural modeling, uh, at the global scale and then particularly at the regional scale, we need more agricultural detail. Uh, and so we are talking about economic and social development uh, narratives uh, and then importantly both biophysical and socioeconomic dimensions, so soil and water resource trends. You know, the various drivers of the systems that we're not all, we're, we can't model all of these components and so we need them to be in a, defined in a scenario sense. Very important, as uh, Jean-Francois Jean, Jean -Francois pointed out this morning, the agri agricultural technology trend assumptions are playing a very important role here. Uh, prices and costs of production uh, and some aspects of policy of, as well, of course. And, and so we've, and what we really have is th there are other elements of work going on, for example, um, Levin mentions the CCAF's work, the CGIR uh, climate change program. They've been developing uh, regional uh, pathways and scenarios that kind of fall between the global and you know what we call regional here on the right hand side where we say regional wraps have typically been sub-national. But CCAF's has been working on a regional basis, meaning West Africa, East Africa, Sub-Saharan, uh, South Asia, and so forth. And so we, we really have this hierarchy uh, between the global down to the, the local. And of course, typically drivers are, are sort of operating often from sort of aggregate down to micro, like I discussed this morning, prices being determined in markets, say global markets, uh, and then you know, influencing local farm management decisions. But at the same time, we need this consistency going both ways. And, and ultimately, of course, I think we could have information flowing, in a sense, both ways. So we just wanted to put everybody on the, the common page in terms of that terminology as we go forward. I think I'm next. Yes. All right. So another uh, protocol element that we've started to think about and are hoping to include all of you in the discussions this week um, are simulation sets. So let me tell you what I mean by that. If you remember the concentric circle diagram that we showed earlier, um, we had an idea to, to have each of those experiments be specifically defined via its elements. Um, and here's just a couple of these uh, within the core that I've tried to lay out. So this is purely just kind of my first thinking of what this would be. So if we were going to do a historical simulation set, uh, we would have to have some kind of uh, storyline, some easy description that we could tell people what we're studying here. Um, in the historical period, we really don't have an RCP. It's just the historical conditions. The SSP, again, what already is there. Uh, the wrap is what's already there. So this is kind of an easy one. And then we would define a certain time period. So in this case, I put 1980 to 2010. And then we would have a separate table that would say, what are the output variables we want for the historical period? So maybe the economists don't care as much about this period, or they have a certain set of variables they want to test. Um, it might be a different set of variables than if we were looking at something like uh, a biofuel scenario. All right, uh, in this no climate change simulation set, Again, we have a simple storyline. Economic development proceeds without climate change impacts. You could think of it like just climate change doesn't happen. This is a good reference scenario for a lot of economic runs. Um, Alex, you can't have RCP 8.5. All right, there we go. The first input from the crowd. You're right. You're absolutely correct. This is my oversight. That was the test. That's too much. All right. But then, separate CO2 effects from, unless you want to separate CO2 effects. No, no, don't get into that. No CO2 there. So, so you're absolutely correct. So this, this is what we would do. We'd be defining these, and over the course of this workshop, this is, this is a table I want to fill out and make sure that we agree on. Um, but we would have a, a socioeconomic pathway. Um, we would have a wrap, because uh, the representative agricultural pathway is what happens uh, through the, the development of the agricultural systems. Um, there would be climate adaptation. 
Uh, but we would have a time period, in this case, I said 2010 to the end of, of the century. Um, and again, we'd have a separate variable list. I, you'll notice this last column always says this because it's just too much to put here. But the, the main message is we would have a specific set of variables that we'd be looking for from each set of models that would be participating. Um, now, if we did a low sustainability future, this would be economic development, which is emphasizing growth over sustainability in terms of env environmental uh, sustainability. And in that case, that associates itself much more clearly with RCP 8.5, the more extreme emissions and, and greenhouse gas concentration scenario. SSP 5, I believe, in the new system is the most kind of growth driven. Um, we would have a, a wrap associated with the low sustainability future. So there would be specific definitions that, that would be within that wrap on global to local scales. Um, and then in terms of adaptation, it's likely that that low sustainability future would have high investment in adaptation. Um, again, we could, we, we could make another scenario where that's not the case, but in our core scenario, we would maybe define it that way. And within this, since this is the first time we've said this, we will have to come up with what that means. So this is a, a topic for this week, is what is a high adaptation investment look like? How do we model it? Is it through the economics on the global scale? Is it through point-based models? Where do we fall on that? But the, the intention is for it to be a global investment strategy as opposed to a regional one. In this case, yes. But for example, we could create a, a different simulation where we have more of the regional inequality that you see in some of the other uh, pathways. Um, or, or it could be some hybrid of the two. Yeah, and then you can see this high sustainability future. This associates itself more with the lower RCP. So here we selected RCP 4.5. Again, there would probably be uh, something more like SSP 1. Uh, we can correct these numbers if they've changed, Brian. But the idea is there's a socioeconomic pathway that is associated with more uh, sustainability focus. Um, and then we would follow this through. We would have a wrap that was associated with high sustainability. Maybe moderate adaptation investment, now, we can debate can, this. Can you argue why that should, should be moderate? If you had low sustainability, I would think you'd have moderate investment. This is the topic of the breakout groups. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get into that. We'll get into it. You know, this is just a strong man to get us thinking. There's philosophy and psychology involved here. That is beyond my opinion. <laughs> it's just to give an example. Just for clarification, yeah. um, I think you're using sustainability to the equivalent to environmental impact. And yes. the sustainability of those multiple domains, as yes. we discussed before. So here it's using a very specific context of environmental impact. You're right. Here, here when I've been using sustainability, it has been environmental impact sustainability. Um, and again, we can. this is what we're here for. We're going to clarify uh, and put some concrete things down. Christoph? Why are we talking about investment in climate adaptation? And well, that, that kind of brings it to monetary terms, and yeah. I think it would be easier if we say we have like a high level of adaptation, no matter if that's expensive or not. Think, yeah. and so again, we can debate this, but but um, yeah, I think that's a good comment. Um, yes, Jim. Uh, the time period, is that implying that you'll have only one time period going all the way to 2100, or do you have, are you going to break that up into multiple well, time periods? When, when well, we, when we talk about the protocols, how we're going to actually run these experiments, we'll talk about that, whether it be a single trajectory, whether it be time slices, uh, whether we would pick. You know, the reason I put that is you'll see, just as an example down here for biofuels, maybe we don't go past 2050. Maybe I, I don't remember if I put that in. Um, but, you know, if, if we really believe that, that going beyond mid-century is a fool's errand because the, the uncertainties overwhelm what we can potentially do, this is up for debate. Um, but there may be situations where we only want to look at a time period. Uh, time slice or, or a capped period. These are things we can define. But the, the main point of me showing this slide, um, we're not going to debate all the way through all these things, uh, except for you know in our breakouts and, and other times this week, we might be able to, to establish some of these. The main thing I want to say is if you want an experiment to be part of CGRA, this is what you have to define. You have to be able to tell me and, and convince this entire group that uh, there are enough people interested in a specific RCP storyline, you know, storyline RCP SSP wrap adaptation, uh, and then these are the time periods and outputs that we'd be interested in looking at. Jess, on the food security one, can we debate now the simulation set? Um, I would suggest we not because we're going to get I lost in all this. I this is the wrong choice to talk about high protein demand. Good. Good. That's, that's why we're here. That's really what we're here. 
We yeah. really just threw this out. It, just keep, it keeps coming up the <coughs> protein thing. Yes. Yeah. Most right. of the world is very sufficient Good. in protein. So we're we're gonna yeah. starting right after this. We're gonna okay. change. Okay. Yes. You know. So sure that we're not we're not de we're debating yeah. the whole. So row. yeah, yeah. <laughs> realize realize that what we're, what we've done and this whole presentation that that the four of us have put together. This is why we put straw man right at the top. Um, and, and I get the, the pleasure of sticking my neck out and presenting the slide. Uh, but you'll see we put, we put one for adaptation, mitigation, food security, and food policy just to get you guys excited to get in those breakouts and say this is what it should be. All right, Frank? Just for clarification. Well, Cynthia introduced the general overview. You had always a pair of options for each of the classifiers, adaptation, mitigation. And apparently you're not following a fully orthogonal approach well, to have all combinations explored. So it would perhaps be helpful to, if we look at adaptation, what are the assumptions of the others with respect to mitigation, food security, food policy, if we have that sure. line yeah, of adaptation. I, I think that's great. Yeah, but I do want to point out one thing, because Gaston brought this up earlier in terms of connectivity. So if you'll notice, this low sustainability future, I can't find the mouse, yeah, this low sustainability future is identical in almost every way to all of these down here, except for one thing. So for example, this high adaptation investment, well, what if it was specifically about heat resistant cultivars or some, some specific thing that we want to test in adaptation that's different from what we already had before? If you are in that line adaptation, uh, mm -hmm. what is the assumption about biofuels? Is it intense or not intense? What's the assumption so, about food security? Again, it protein? would be defined within, you know, for anything that is listed here, this would be, you know, if this were a website, you'd click on that and you get the, more detailed explanation. But Frank, are you saying there should be a column for mitigation? Now, if you go back to the overview of uh, Cynthia that she sh showed before. The concentric circles. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, sure. Right. Because you give that overview, and if you just change one, you should also clarify what about, like in the adaptation, mm -hmm. you look into heat resistant varieties, but what is the assumption that scenario with respect to food policy? Are you high export yeah. controls or ecosystem protection so this with mitigation? Yeah. Are you in intense biofuels or high fuel? So, so our, our original, our starting straw man intention was to have each of these external ones be consistent with something in the middle. It's, I, I, what Cynthia has set up with this axis of adaptation and mitigation is not to compare all the way on this extreme with all the way on this extreme. No, it's not so much forget. We're trying to distinguish and, and separate some of the, the, mm. the, you know, trying to get at a point where we can actually say how this single change has made a difference. Now, if you're going to make an argument that they work in combination and that there are certain combinations that make more sense than others, I would agree with you, and I think that there might be ways to do this. But the design of this is to allow us to look at specific policy decisions, specific adaptation decisions, specific uh, mitigation, et cetera, uh, in a way that actually allows us to attribute the difference to something that was changed. Yeah. I think that's really uh, maybe a central issue here because when uh, you have shown the five SSPs, uh, indeed the five SSPs, uh, and Brian uh, can tell far more than me about this, were um, um, designed to reflect on this adaptation to mitigation trade off, and this is uh, really four and five. And uh, if you here have the core, which is just about uh, low and high environmental sustainability, uh, you're going to contrast, I would say, between uh, um, in a way which is uh, one to three, and if you want to go to adaptation and mitigation, it's four and five. So, so I'm not exactly sure that you can just add on a bit more adaptation to one uh, SSP, a bit more mitigation to another, because they are just designed in ways where uh, it interacts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of questions. First, going back to your table, do you have a sense of how many different scenarios is realistic given the capacity of the Agnet community? Yeah. I mean, you've got you have the number that fit on one screen here, but yeah. So, so certainly this, this was not meant to, you can see my, my uh, caveat on the far right. For demonstration, not comprehensive. The, so in general, you know, this is another tension I think is going to come up throughout the week that the number of elements of this system that we're looking at and the possible combination, combinations, permutations of all these things is overwhelming. Um, and that we you know, could do the full matrix, which ends up being a seven to 20 dimensional matrix. I don't know what we want to get into here. Um, so we are going to run into a limit. And I think one of the things we want to explore this week is how many things we realistically can do. I would, I would 
venture a guess, maybe at the risk of, of uh, or at the intent of spurring debate rather than getting my head bitten off. Um, but you know, I would I would guess we do not want to be more than you know a dozen or two okay. simulation or you know total fakes because it's a lot of effort and the analysis is also a, a tremendous amount of uh, investment. Um, wait, is it right off that? Yeah. It's about input variables. It looks to me like, maybe I'm wrong here, we should reduce climate change to a single input variable, and that is the difference in average surface temperature. Oh, that, that was never the intention. No, no, but that's what comes out from the slides I have seen. Uh, am I getting it wrong completely? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. There, would, there would be full scenarios. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a, maybe a question on, so the second line going all the way across, no climate change, for the purposes of the analysis, what's the value of that? So um, I maybe should leave it to, I don't know if Dominique or, or Sherman want to do this, but my understanding is the global economists like to compare a future where something has been, you know, some shock has been imposed like climate change versus a future if that hadn't happened. It's so like the, it's a control run, a reference, run, a reference run. Reference. Okay. Future, climate, future change is no climate change. Future economic. Everything yeah. goes forward, but climate change. What is it a reference to? Get the exact matchup that you're going to... Well, the idea, for example, would be if we ran a low sustainability future, we could get to the 2050s and say the prices are higher here than if no climate change, but if climate change got hadn't happened. That's got climate change and investment and all yes. sorts of other so, things. You need, you need orthogonality here. You don't know what you've evaluated. So, so what, what I would argue, and we're getting a little ahead of ourselves here and, and potentially derailing, the, the idea there, <laughs> derailing this, this presentation, you know, the idea is the adaptation and climate change are linked. You wouldn't be adapting to climate change if there wasn't climate change happening. And likewise, you likely would not have climate change and not bother to adapt. Um, so in that sense, they're a little bit inextricably linked. Uh, so the orthogon orthogonality, um, I, I don't see them as, as fully separable so, I mean, in that sense. Should, if at this meeting, we should write down the fully orthogonal set, and then yeah. if it's too much, we should we can start yeah. xing out and, the. And for example, maybe one want. of the adaptation yeah. scenarios is no adaptation. You know, that could be an interesting one to look at. And you know, these are what we need to propose. People in the back of anybody, Christoph. I think the, the problem with the discussion is that the columns that you have are too aggregate, mm -hmm. because all of them can include like at least ten different input variables That's that you right. harmonize right. them. And I think that yes. that needs to be clarified. What, but I, what is I, comprised in right. RCP? Is it just CO2? Or is it including all the other uh, atmospheric components? Well, that one's that easy because the RCPs are clearly defined already. Yeah. The yeah. SSPs are... Do we consider ozone? Do we consider mm -hmm. nitrogen deposition? Do we consider there are many things... So as we could scenario discussion, you've mm -hmm. taken an infinite dimensional scenario space and tried to boil it down into four labels that everyone disagrees on <laughs> the meaning of the mark. <laughs> so um, that's, you know, that's why we need to expand this set of columns and really define them extremely well and really lay out the different classes. Yeah, but you know, these, these are intended to be aggregate columns. And what you would do is, you know, so you're part of GG's, you know, the global graded group. You and Joshua and the other global graded modelers would have to say, these are the elements that we need, these are the input variables we need, and this is what we think we can produce. And you know, what would be needed, you guys would know, in RCP 8.5, the global graded people will use this. You will have that written down somewhere, and you will also have a list of output variables that you think you can produce um, for a certain scenario that would be interesting. Can, can I make a, just a quick yeah. follow-up comment to that point? So if you, if you look at the, the handbook we've developed for our regional integrated assessment protocols, you know, all of those details are laid out. They can't be put in a table like this. So, you know, yeah, ultimately we're going to have to, once we sort of agree on the overall thing, uh, we're really going to have to sit down and hammer out those gory details and write them down so everybody knows what they are. Yeah, it, it might also be worth saying, you know, it, in this week, which is going to start feeling very short, very quickly, I'm guessing, considering that some of the challenges here, the protocols document, I think, that we're looking for at the end of the week are not the units and scale of every variable that, that are going to be, that, that level of detail, I think, won't happen this week. It's more of, you know, can we start to get an idea of, like, are these the right aggregate ca categories? Can we start to think about what might fall under here? The skeleton of that, the main framework, is what I think we hope to get, along with the narrative of implementation. I, I hope that's fair. Um, Follow-up, and then I know in the back they've been waiting for a second. Yeah, so I, I don't know if this goes in the derailing <laughs> topic. Um, 
and maybe you want to save this for, for later, but one of the primary goals of the scenario framework, the combination of SSPs and RCPs, was to facilitate studies that could look at one socioeconomic pathway and look at the effect of cl different levels of climate, or one climate future and look at the effect of different development pathways. This design doesn't do either. Now that's not necessarily bad, it's just skipping the primary goals uh, that that framework was meant to facilitate. What it does do, for the most part, is a, a big sensitivity analysis around one scenario. So it takes SSP 8.5 and does a lot of variations, which I think is useful and interesting. I would think, though, that for what other things you want to do, I just don't know what you're going to find out from changing both the climate and the SSP. So. You know, other than saying a high sustainability future will be better than a low one. Well, we, we know that, but we won't know why. We, we won't know whether it's because there's less climate or because incomes are higher or institutions work better or there's differences in trade. We, we won't know any of that. Um, so I would just, you know, I would think about that. I mean, I think there's also questions about you know, SSP-5 is actually not a low sustainability with the exception of it's got a lot of climate change if there's no mitigation. But otherwise, it's very high investments, the highest in health, education, local environmental issues, air quality, things like that. So there's smaller things about the specific number that goes up there. But I think the big one is just to think about yeah. that. So I, mean, I just want to quickly respond because I would argue that what we have down here so far is locked in, the, and I don't mean to say locked in as in written in stone, but what I mean is the thing that's changing really is this wrap category. So SSP5, but then you have different combination of wraps that go with the different classification <coughs> sets. And there may be some aspects of some wraps that are already specified in the storylines of the SSPs. And also another concern related to that is that there may be some wraps that we are missing because we don't take some SSPs, like for instance SSP4, which is very much into inequal world with a lot of poverty. And there is a lot of interest also in that scenario. And the fact that here we do not have anything about SSP4, uh, for me that's also a concern. Yeah. So I really wonder if, for instance, it goes also in the direction of, of uh, the one from Ryan. Why not just taking a simple framework of costing certain number of dimensions, making sure that we don't have any gaps in the design, and also making sure that we can find all the wraps that we want in the different SSPs in order to have all the compensated outcome we want. Yeah, so I, I, well taken comment, and again, I think this is the tension, we're seeing it right here, which is, do we span across many to understand you know, the potentials, or do we try to align and say this wrap only makes sense under this SSP? There's a tension here on that. But let's keep moving, we're going to have a, a lot of time to discuss this this week, these are some of the this, this is kind of one of these tables. If we, if we come up this week with a full understanding of this table, I'll be quite thrilled. And, and, and an agreed version. Yeah. Agreed version. All right. So um, global and regional linkages is, is another element. Um, I actually want to take an opportunity to jump back. I'm going to still going back to Cynthia's slide. This is really a key figure. Uh, this is kind of our vision, and, and we really want to, to make sure people understand this and, and are ready to go. And, what we just were talking about is what I would put in that center circle. It's the kind of, what, once we set up all these models, what are we going to run? What are we going to drive them with? Uh, what scenarios, what experiments are we going to run? Uh, what I'm going to talk about now is the linkages across the, the, the scales and across the disciplines. Because this is the other key advance that we're, we're trying to take on with the coordinated global and regional assessments. So, um, to do that, you know, one thing that we wanted to emphasize is just, at, at some level, this is what Agrip has been doing for five years. We've been building up pieces. We've been working within regions. You see here shaded. We've been setting up networks of uh, sites where we can truly evaluate crop models. Um, you can see all the wheat, maize, rice, sugarcane, potato pilots, and other things going on. All the crops that are included in some level in C3MP and, and other projects with the NAGMIP. We've also been setting up uh, networks. What you see here is actually the half degree global grid that the global grid and crop modelers have been running on for their global assessments, as well as a finer grid that they've been using over the United States. And I know that it's not just the US with a fine grid. I was just talking this morning with Sibiri about the craft product in West Africa, which is running about 10 kilometer resolution. Um, 
But in addition to this grid, we also are, are increasingly setting up networks of crop models. I lost the mouse again. Networks of, um, let me finish my explanation, I'll go back. So there's also these networks of, of crop modeling sites. The blue ones here are the C3MP sites. The brown square, it might be a little bit hard to see in the back, those are sites that the wheat team are looking at right now um, to, to try to come up with a way of looking at global wheat production. Um, I also put on this same chart, the, what you see as these polygons here are the food producing units of the impact model, um, which is kind of one of the global economic scales. And I've also put just a couple in red stars here. These are some of the regional integrated assessments that we've been doing economics um, at. And I know this is a much smaller sample than what is actually going on. Um, for example, the TOAMD economic model has more than 100 users around the world, probably many, 600, there we go. So many, many more locations going on. But what we end up with are networks of sites where work is going on, as well as global coverage. And the linkages across the scales, we are going to try to figure out how that top down and the bottom up meet, and hopefully come up with a hybrid approach that is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, so this is, this is kind of what we're working at. Um, I think I've already said what I want to say. Here's just, again, an example of West Africa, where people might be setting up networks. Uh, this one, I believe, is for John. Wait, just oh. could you just go back and then you wanted to look yes, at the other a, ones? You yeah. had a question? So I just want to make sure I understand yeah. this and it, it's my trying to catch up, so I apologize. Mm -hmm. So what this means, I think, is that back into the table that is going to be the subject of much discussion for the rest of the week, the scenarios that can be run are kind of limited to these five value chains. I'm forgetting the comments that Levin, I think it was, who was making earlier about you know, the, number, the, the diversity of agricultural production systems around the world, and I just want to make sure that, you know, we're not... So I want to make sure that at least my thinking well, about that table yeah. is bounded correctly given the resources you have to bring to bear. So the short answer is no, that, that what you've just described is more limited than what, we're gonna, what we are planning. So there are dozens of, of crops involved in some of the global graded models. The global economics models have, uh, have categories of crops. Some of them have much more detail than other. Um, but it is not limited to these. The yes, if you wanted to think about agroforestry as an adaptation option, you can do that. Yeah. Well, I mean, with some with some of the regional models, certainly. You can. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, whether you can with the global models, I guess that's a question I would pose to the global guys. I, I didn't mean to derail. No, 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 you're, not, you're not. You're not. You're not. And this is it's, something. It's, 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 this is. Do we, we put this in just to say this is just to show that the regions and some of the sites that the uh, specific crop crops uh, crop work has been done. But then actually the next one shows yeah. much more. And actually the next slide okay. kind of speaks, speaks to that to uh, question. Right. It's really um, so this is a graphic. It's 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 not the most elegant one we've ever developed, but uh, it's just to make this point that uh, going back to the regional integrated assessment methods that we've been developing where um, this big box in the upper left uh, is representing the idea of a, a farming system, which, again, is not characterized just as, you know, a commodity, but rather a farming system that, may in, that typically involves, you know, in the developing world, multiple crops, very often livestock, uh, can be aquaculture and other things as well. Um, and and we, on a regional basis, we're trying to, again, characterize the heterogeneity and the distributional consequences of climate change and other changes using that approach. But that approach, like I said this morning, is, is fed by the global modeling uh, studies that give us prices, which are, you know, come from a combination of the global economic models, the global gridded uh, crop models. Um, and, of course, there's the potential for this to be a closed loop uh, in, in the uh, assessment process. Um, uh, and, the, and, again, as I said this morning, that is a bit this methodological challenge between the regional and the, the more aggregate, is that, on the one hand, we have this complex farming system approach, uh, and then we have global uh, or more aggregate models that give us prices of, it's true, more than just five main commodities, but still we don't find prices in those models for uh, cassava uh, and, uh, you know, pigeon pea uh, uh, 
et cetera. So there are a number of these, you know, orphan crops that are missing. Uh, and they're, they're, they're quite weak on the, the input side in terms of costs of production for important things. Uh, so labor in particular is a big challenge. So, so there are these, 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 these big challenges to sort of cutting across these scales. Just, I wanted to go back one, just to, just to, okay. just to talk about this for one second. Do you have the mic? Um, here, yeah. just go. Um, which is, I think, also a part of our task for this week is to how do we link the network of carefully evaluated sites with comprehensive give, grid coverage to create an improved, we're calling hybridized product. Because this is in part the crux of what we're really trying to do this week is the linkage part. We, we need to design the scenario part too. That's extremely important, obviously. We have to do that. That's the assessment design. But, the, you know, but part of the real advance methodologically is to come up with a few things like this to say we really are linking global and regional and getting unimproved product. And that's, um, that's going to be a, a big part of the discussion also in the breakout groups. So, uh, and th this, is, uh, this is on the biophysical side and in the, in the economic side. How are you guys, I know you guys have already started some discussions. How are you really going to make those linkages so that you we're really learning from, from, the, from what's happening in the regions? And, you, and improving what the global grid is doing, and then how can the global grid also, on both the biophysical and the economic, really feed back to the regions to make it make the understanding there better? That's another very core part of, of what we're doing this week. Good. Okay. So that's those are the protocol elements. Um, and then, oh, then we get outputs, <laughs> of course. And we'll, so again, something else that we'll have to decide. And again, how many are we going to get? I mean, it's almost, you know, hundreds and hundreds of things that we could possibly look at. Again, very much straw um, person. And please, you know, that's why we need um, the uh, food security and nutrition and diet specialists here to really help us. What is it that we, uh, what are the prioritized outputs from each one of the building blocks? So these are some examples. But again, this is part of the work that we'll be doing in the building block groups to, to okay, say, well, what really is it that if we, and if we include what, and should, if, should we include water resources, this would be a place where we could, because we can certainly get it. So those are the outputs. And then, of course, I won't belabor this, the whole idea is to be able to have outcomes that answer the questions that were posed in the beginning. That's why it's the whole suite and sweep of the protocols is so important so that in the end, we can say, well, what are the capabilities and limits to adaptations with specific information? What are the effects? In really an improved, there's been many very good studies, excellent studies, but this with the multi-model approach, coordinated global and regional, what are the effects of agricultural mitigation policies? What can we say in a very, like really from this linked, working together on the food security issue and um, something on the diet? Uh, and then what can we say about food policies? So that's really the goal to have, and to have those answers that we're bringing forward have the, be stronger than they've ever been before. That's r really the goal. Okay, how are we, okay, how are we, okay, so that's like the what, right? Of, and then this is more the how of organization and partners, funding strategy, and benefits to participation. So in order to do this, we need to have teams. AGMIP works with teams. We need, so we've, we, we showed some building blocks. So we need building block leads. And we like co-leads in general because <laughs> in this day and age, right, everyone is so busy with all the multiple uh, projects that we're working on. So we, we like to have co-leads. Um, 
uh, as, uh, and geographically distributed if possible. Um, and teams of people who want to work on, for example, the um, local crop modeling, um, for example. But at the same time, we have another uh, layer, which is the regions. So we would also, so the building blocks are really the, um, uh, the disciplinary modeling. And we can, and probably there may be, there may be and there may be uh, global and local groups uh, within that first, that first type of team on the building block teams. Uh, we need regional leads and teams. That's, we, I've been meeting with the folks who are gonna be on the regional panel tomorrow. We clearly need an IT team and leads. We have a great IT team in Agmap, as we said, we don't know whether we can burden them this with all this, really, this big new effort. So, you know, I'm looking at Jim because Jim is <laughs> as the, um, really, the, uh, the, like, the super, the super lead of, of the IT. Um, and then a science integration team. So probably maybe all the leads come together to have a group that we're going to be, how do we make, you know, how do we come to decisions about how this will, how the, um, the assessment will proceed. So we would definitely need a scientific, a science integration team to all work together to come to consensus on the decisions. So that's the organizations. Uh, that's our ideas of organization. Um, I'm going to show this one, which is, we often show this, this slide at uh, our global workshops because these are some of the many partners and donor institutions involved in AGMA. This is just to say there are many, many possible partners already of all the many people who have already worked in AGMA and their institutions. Um, so uh, just, uh, it's it, while well, we're in a very small group now, which uh, really will be we really setting really setting the process in motion. But we will, of course, be in training um, many many partners. And of course, the funding strategy. We are researchers. We all have jobs and we need to keep our jobs and funding is essential so people can <laughs> feed their families right uh, it's another part of agriculture and food security um, so <laughs> so what we've come up with um, in, our, in our discussion last night with, and with John he said uh, you know at first we said often we say with AGMIP it's very distributed funding um, we, we fund by different, you know, things get going and we fund it and also it's distributed geographically. But what we really think um, is that this is, needs to be a hybrid approach. We need some project funding to make this happen. Uh, so that, to have a core project. This is really quite, uh, quite an undertaking, a significant undertaking if we indeed do go forward uh, with this, and we certainly hope that we uh, that we will, and it will we will need to be looking for some core project funding. But beyond that, for the participation of the different groups, we'll certainly be looking to regional and national agricultural programs to fund the participation. This is how CMIP is funded by the nations who have the GCMs in their countries, right? Uh, for example. Um, we very much hope that development agencies will see that that this we that will be pro providing key information needed. We very much hope, and also will be in training and capacity building for uh, researchers and st uh, and improving the cap the capacity of uh, low income countries uh, to really uh, understand improve their um, decision making around um, around climate risk. Um, and then, of course, international organizations, such as the bank and others, we would certainly hope that they would see that this would be, and, this, and, um, and actually CG may be more in kind of the partnership, but we'll see, you know, CG is definitely an international organization, but we very much want to partner with CG systems, CCAFs, you know, we have, we have very strong ties with them. So... Uh, we're going to be doing, this is the strategy so far. Again, we're, we're very open in the discussion period for ideas on how to make this happen. I guess maybe we didn't put 
any private sector, maybe looking to Jerry and Dave for our, who are our conduits there. Um, you know, why don't we? You know, maybe we can talk about seeing if we if if there's a way that we could really. Um, make that linkage that that we've had to be honest quite as you as you were saying quite a, quite a, quite a hard struggle to actually get the the private sector agribusinesses um, to to really see oh yes this is really helpful for us uh, is worth our while so that's the funding strategy and the last slide oh you did which is on the timeline. Uh huh. Okay, I'm gonna go to the. I'm gonna. Let's see. Well, we'll just do it because we'll, it was the timeline was one of the questions from before. Um, we I I think we need to really be on, be be honest with each other and ourselves about benefits to participation. We it needs to be great for everybody. It's it's uh, these kinds of as we all know, we're we're in a field that's that's a tremendous amount of work. So what is it that participating in such an effort would bring, right? So first and foremost, because we're, research, we're researchers and scientists, is learning. We just will really, this is an opportunity to really learn a lot. Um, if those of us who have individual models or who are working on, who, many of the people in the room have their own, have the model or their modeling group that they're working with, with their group. So individual model improvement, that's what we find I, I think that's one of the main motivations for people to uh, to participate in all the uh, many of the AgMIP um, activities so far, because as you as you intercompare and do multi-model ensemble approaches, you really really get to see your model and you get to see what other people are doing, and then you can re re really jumpstart the improvement of your model. Um, this is a little bit linked to number one, is new cross-scale discipline methodologies. This is a little bit what I was talking about before as I went back to, the, to show that example of the point-based crop models to the grid-based. We really have the opportunity here to develop new methods on, um, on this cross-scale and um, discipline linkages. Um, you know, we have, we, AGMIP is five, about five years old, and you know, we are talking, you know, John, don't you think it, we've interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary discourse and, uh, uh, you know, we, we, talk, we know how to talk to a little bit more. <laughs> it's still hard sometimes, but, you know, we've really learned a lot and, we're, and there's so much more to learn. And this is um, very much, and to develop um, cross-discipline methodologies together. Um, then it also provides opportunities for leadership. Um, we need, um, and this is great, I think, for, um, you know, early career and uh, we're, uh, um, and mid-career scientists working with AGMIP, it's, I hope people who are part of it feel that it's um, a good experience and a leadership opportunity. And then finally, last but not least, um, Martin Parry, who was uh, the co-chair of the first phase of AGMIP, one of the co-chairs, at one, at one global workshop, I don't know if any of you remember if you were there, he got up and he said, why are you all here? You're here because you're going to be an author on at least four papers. <laughs> so it's, I do believe it's also true, get, you know, get with Agma because it is, it's basically a kind of publication machine. <laughs> so there's, a, there's real potential for authorship on multiple, multiple papers. So, without, I'm going to turn over to you for the timeline. You have one more add. Sure. And any other, yes, you're going to add, a, add a, yeah. any a benefit from your guys? And I realize we didn't, we didn't put this explicitly on here, but um, our intention in many ways, similar to what CMIP has done, is also to make these outputs publicly available. And in that sense, there will be a tremendous opportunity for citations of and continuing use of your data sets, probably in ways that we can't envision right now. Um, yeah, there, are, uh, there are a number of extensions and potential applications lot of user groups in the scientific community looking for these types of data, even as the background for their, you know, their other kind of social study or who knows what. Um, so that's, I think, that's another benefit. That. That's yeah. a really good point. Okay. Any Anything other comments on this? Timeline. Any other comments on this before I get to the timeline? I just can't help um, noticing that you're missing the sort of the most important new element in your future direction that you're inviting your stakeholders to be with you. Yes, yes. Because you well, want to give them... Yeah 
the outcome of your science in a way that they can use it. So in some sense, that knowledge that you're generating that they want to use is a product that you're making yeah. a commitment. Yes, right? good. Yeah. Yes, we'll add that too. That's great. Yeah. And Jean-François. Yes. I, no, I was just uh, reflecting on uh, uh, one part, which is um, we have a lot of indirect coupling here. And I think uh, we should be, uh, let's say, quite conscious of uh, the benefits and drawbacks of the situation. Because there are also, obviously, integrated assessment models, some of them being represented here. Mm -hmm. And they are fairly advanced already on the combinations of SSP, time RCPs, time wraps. Mm -hmm. They already have results, it's going to be published, some of it is already published. So uh, why not have something about integrated assessment models as one core activity of this? and uh, trying to compare what you get with the direct coupling in those models with the indirect coupling strategy you have been showing here. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think that unless you do this, you're going to miss a lot of the dynamic elements which happen in a complex integrated models. Because if you impose some indirect coupling, you're never, never going to have the feedbacks. You, know? you impose, for example, a price level, but then it could be that uh, on the local situation, you have uh, yield responses which are quite different to the expectation of the global economic model, which means the feedback on prices you're not going to get because it's indirect. Uh, so I think we need to have a strategy with both the direct coupling and the indirect coupling. And this uh, also goes up, it would need more careful discussion obviously, uh, to the comparison between the gridded and the local situations and so on. So it would take time to really explore this, but I think it requires a lot of attention. Yeah, that's well taken. And I would also, I would probably argue, maybe we'll talk about this in coffee breaks, but there are elements of what we're doing that are actually more directly coupled than what some of the IAMs do in the sense of things like number three here, some of these cross scale and, and you know, including adaptation all the way from the crop models through in some of kind of what you're saying, but a little bit more endogenous than what it was before. Um, John? For example, I, I, one of what I think you would be referring to as an IEM in that context would be the, the YASA model, Globium, right? So that it has been part of the global model um, group. So, so we're not excluding those by any means. And, and sure, I, I guess my vision is that um, rather it, it, it's just that um, on, but what Globium uh, doesn't do is to uh, really provide a way to look at the, the, the farming system, on, let's say, on a regional basis. So, so, yeah, there might be a way to indirectly couple, or there might actually be a way to directly couple. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, yes. great. That, that's very helpful. And, and now we flip some switches yeah. in the back of the room. <laughs> I think, in fact, of the representation of the IAM, we're not that bad currently in the global economic group because we have the five IAMs that participate uh, as a marker for the different SSPs, also uh, for uh, the working group three activities. So we are represented there. But indeed, uh, in terms of integration, there's been this phase one. We did a great job uh, in terms of integrating, I think, the different global tools. You know, so there is this question of integrating the, general, the, the regional tools. And still beside, I think still on the, on the role of the IEM, uh, what maybe uh, might be missing is uh, how those scenarios also fit with the more general work which is done by this IEM community, because in particular, so we are working with, with those scenarios, in our set of scenarios and combinations, and that's where maybe there could be more synergies. So trying to identify what are the scenarios that will really be markers for the main community, also in terms of feedback, and what are the, the feedback between also mitigation and the feedback from mitigation then to the, to the impacts, and what are the scenarios that maybe are more, uh, more let's say, um, in satellite of all these uh, common efforts. Would that, in part, be reflected in the scenario design, some of the issues we were talking about earlier? Yeah, yeah. I think I would, you know, I think that is a topic that we table, that the question is that you need to discuss how do you take, now you have a combination of RCPs, SSPs, and you know, um, the RACs. How do you reduce the dimensionality mm -hmm. of these to a really a critical, a unique subset that are manageable and tractable? Yes. And, you know, 
would you like to, are you planning to discuss this? Oh, yes, in, very much so. You know, as, as a forum or a separate by a group or how, how do you plan to do that? You know? Well, for example, I think it will come up tomorrow morning in some of the discussions and then in the breakouts tomorrow afternoon that will be one of the yeah, questions. Yeah, part of all these yeah. sort of activities. Right. Yeah, well, can, I, can I ask a, almost a marketing question? Um, so, assuming, you know, moderate, you know, funding to enable this, what would you say would be, as a result of this analysis versus the last one, be the three significant improvements on why the product is, you know, significantly better? Definitely one is the improved, is the combination of the global and region. That is everything so far that AGMIF has done has been separated. The global modelers have published their results and the regional modelers have published their results. And they weren't connected, really. I well, mean, not just AGMIF, but I mean the whole, oh, the the whole, whole community. Right, the whole community. Yeah. But this time, because agriculture is so uniquely both a global system and a regional system, it's absolutely essential that you to understand what will happen to agriculture. You have to understand both. So, so structured protocol and greater digitalization, if you will. So that you so what I'm hearing is that you're you're able to take it regionally much more accurately. And and it feeds and, upwards as well. And yeah. with, with with the feedbacks. But uh, rather than having big swaths of the globe just kind of with a number. You're trying to digitize it a little bit more so you believe it's going to be more accurate for policymakers or investment yeah. decisions. I'm just trying yeah. to yeah. dramatically yeah. improve Judgment. synthesis, like you know, in terms of improving the quality of, of our models and our and our development strategies, and also just like the fidelity of our um, of what we're assessing, like increasing you know adaptation um, in all these different ways, being able to study different adaptation dimensions. Um, different development pathways, looking at the interactions of fertilizers and climate change, and um, and all of these different aspects. So fidelity, quality, all of these different advances. Um, That's big and, picture. And then with, within each of those going across, in theory, you could blow that up. You know, let's say a nutrition security, and you know you've got your different groups, but you could blow that up because you've got better data sets and so forth. And mm -hmm. then folks that are particularly interested yes. in an item, yeah. you know. Are, You've got your control groups, if you will, do nothing and all that. And then you can compare, right. you know, adaptation policies or resilience right. policies versus, you know, long-term R&D projects. Right. And a lot of that's going to rest on our, I mean, the sort of manpower that we have to do the, the sure. deep levels of analysis that are going to be but required to produce money, all this information. If you could raise money and also the IT some structure. of those cells that yeah. might be, you know, so folks, so, because I'd have a, you know, if you could expand some of those cells, you would change that slide for certain donors. The Wait, participation. Jim, is this a follow-up comment? To it's just a, yeah, to answer to that, I think what Jerry asked is really critical, and I think the answer that Cynthia gave initially is more the scientific thing, but we need to go into these nutrition, the water limitations, the extreme events, and, and risk assessments. Mm -hmm that would really interest uh, Donald Trump. Right. So the participation that I was saying was, the, the, this slide, which I, yeah, I, I think it, it's, it was exactly to the researchers who are actually going to do right. the, be a part of it, because yeah. we it's to be, in, you know, it's like we'll all work together to do it, and that's the participation I was talking about. I definitely feel, we, let's make another slide, it's on the marketing side to say, and this is exactly why it's so much better, and we'll work on that too. Right, and, and then I think on the credibility point that we've been talking about, uh, using multiple models rather than a model, for example, big part of the credibility and the characterization of uncertainty, which people have been asking for. So, yeah, but that's an excellent question. Yeah. How is this better? <laughs> We'd better be able to answer that question yeah, pretty well. We <laughs> is this direct follow-up? This morning we gave some answers when we said, that's why for Friday, so. that's, yeah. that's for Friday. <laughs> yeah, Can? We, we, we gave some already. Okay. Um, part of the marketing, I can see that this would be one big, huge paper and I think that maybe Jerry's point about breaking it down into what message you're trying to sell um, 
I, I, I'm sort of wondering whether any of those adaptations uh, have been done before and why we're better this time. Um, the other one is that we didn't talk a lot about multi-model, but obviously it must be, and it's likely multi-model with dominance at the gridded level. Isn't that correct? That's, by dominance? that's definitely a topic of conversation. Okay. I don't think it's establishing. Yeah. Or it should be. Well, yeah. you're doing multi-model in the right way. I mean, you've yeah. done a multi-model assessment before, but you have to do it with really strict and rigorous and robust protocols so that the models are actually comparable and they're actually, everyone's doing the same thing. And that's, that's, what, that's what we've spent the last, like, two years, two years actually <laughs> crushing our models. It's coming up to what is new. What is new as adaptation? What is new as multi-model, global, science? To sell it. Right? Um, so this question goes back to um, Cynthia's slide of the questions and the overarching question in particular. And I'm thinking about that because uh, any design that you come up with, um, and, and also I think these uh, points that Jerry just raised, you'd want to be able to have them rooted in the question. You should say, why are you doing these scenarios? Well, because this is our question, and that's how we answer yes. it. Yes. So this core question, to me, is um, about, says, what we want to know about is low versus high sustainability. This is a sustainability study. And a really important question is, what is the difference between a low sustainability future and a high sustainability future? And we're going to take the ag part of that, but actually the climate part of the ag question. And so my question is, is that really what you want to know about? Yeah, so I, I would say specifically following your comments earlier when I had the table up about sustainability being too limited in some level, especially environmental sustainability as a subset of that, uh, I would I would guess we're going to revise this question to be to be a little bit more clear because it's not it's not limited specifically to that question. There's elements all the way through here. I think that go beyond that top core question. Yeah, and and we'll we'll get to those. So I think we do need to revise that top question. Okay. Sure. Yeah, no, I think the, the questions are well phrased, especially if we do integrate uh, the risk assessment uh, and the extreme events in question one, which was uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, then I'd just like to point that uh, mitigation is here, and I believe it's an extremely important driver for future scenarios. And uh, this also goes back to the type of modeling we're doing. And um, uh, in the grid at intercomparison, uh, I've talked with Joshua to check it, that you have some of the uh, greenhouse gas modeling and salt carbon modeling. Uh, I'd just like to mention that with a connection with the GRA, we are doing the model benchmarking and intercomparison for both crop and grassland with greenhouse gas emissions, so this could help, in fact. And uh, I think that uh, this would be quite central to uh, try beyond what we heard about, uh, let's say, the use of SSP time RCP combination and whatever the final design would be, would be good, uh, to try to take some of the specific policy-relevant elements from those questions and add them as modifiers of the SSP time RCP to me, it would be more important than taking the very specific adaptation you mentioned, uh, heat tolerant varieties. Why not? I mean, but there are so many other things. Uh, if we were to have modifiers like uh, what can we create as resilience with an extreme drought event uh, that would reduce yields, just one thing. What would we create as a, a food security in a world where we have drastic uh, greenhouse gas mitigation in agriculture, because we know the prices are going to go up in that case. Uh, this would be very important modifiers, and in each case we would address the resilience of uh, the system in terms of food security, low greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, yeah, stability of the yield and so, so on. So, I'd love to try to paraphrase that back to you just sure. to understand. So rather than coming up with scenarios and then looking for questions that they're answering, start with the questions and then develop the scenarios for each specific. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, I just would certainly keep the SSP time RCP combinations, yeah. uh, but as modifiers, mm -hmm. I would add some policy relevant questions yes. rather than things which to me are a bit small details compared to the size of those questions. Mm -hmm.
All right, Christoph, I did see you had your hand up about 20 minutes ago. Do you still have a question? All right, we'll let it go. All right, I, I'm going to get to the, the very end because I know we're getting close to our mixer, and I think all of us uh, are ready for that. Um, we did have a request earlier about the timeline, and I said this very quickly, but I, I just wanted to show it. The, the way we've initially thought about this, and this is, again, up for conversation this week, is to start with an estimation that the IPCC AR6 is probably going to be coming out 2020-ish. Okay, it's, it's not quite in my, but if we start with this as an idea, this is just, I'm, this timeline is up here to give an idea of the type of time pressure that might exist. But at the same time, I want to emphasize before we get into this, um, last IPCC assessment, there was no conversation like this until maybe, you know, the year before. And that led to a lot of very rushed studies. And so I, I would, rather than being intimidated, oh my gosh, it's coming. We're actually in much better shape this time. We have, we have the opportunity, starting with this, present, with this workshop, to get our feet under ourselves, to get the coalition on board, and to do it the right way, um, even though we always wish we had more time. But if, that's, if the IPCC AR6 is published in 2020, we have to have our research published the year before. Um, and therefore, we have to be doing the work at least a year before that. Um, we figure by you know, 2017, we'd have to have the protocols finalized and the study beginning probably at least two years uh, or more than a year to get the work done. Um, and if this is the case, um, maybe next year what we really need to be doing is coming up with prototype projects, uh, looking at how these connections work, maybe scenario development uh, to get these protocols finalized. We're not going to have the finalized perfectly done right away. We need probably a year of prototype projects to get the protocols ironed out. Um, and test some of these ideas out uh, before we release them to everybody and invite the entire world of, of uh, modelers to, to do them. We want to make sure we are happy with them. And then, of course, here we are launching CGRA in 2015, building some coalitions. I figure between now and the end of the year, this is going to be the primary purpose and maybe scoping out some of those prototype projects. Uh, so this is the timeline that I think I wrote in an email three or four months ago. Um, and, and this hopefully is a topic of conversation uh, this week, whether this is realistic, whether we might need to tighten the prototype projects, expand them, I don't know, uh, get them going next week. Uh, we'll have to figure that out. So I think with that, our next slide says discussion, but like a good argument meeting, we've been having that throughout. Um, I think, is there anything else we need to do today before the... Uh, uh, yeah, we had just put, we had added that. Yeah. But is there, are there any final thoughts <laughs> before we, yeah. Number one, it's sure. Just, so just in, in terms of your very near term timeline mm -hmm. and thinking about the kinds of emissions pathways, I wonder if you have, maybe you've already done this, if you've just looked at the INDCs that have been submitted to date and said, what if that's, if we succeed as a, you know, as a planet in those, what does that represent, what does that pathway look like and do you want to include that in your... That's, we were discussing this at dinner last night um, because Gossip has been, has done a project like that, but was, it wasn't focused on agriculture, right? No, basically the majority of them, mm -hmm. to his point, are really targeting mid-century as sort of the target for implementation. The question is that, are we factoring uh, that, those targets into our plans? Um, it's, a very, it's a good suggestion. Do you want to use that yes. as one of the emission yes. scenarios yes. under which agriculture will have to that's a, that's a, It's a very good suggestion. And we've got some of the big ones already submitted, right? So we know what it's mm -hmm. like. Right. And we'll, really, there will be better. Really, we would have to bring in climate models to run them there. So the majority of them, the yeah, the majority of the INDCs, at least, they are targeting this notional two degrees or equivalent um, warming potential to that. And I think the point here is that are there any of these scenarios that we are working towards are consistent with what the nations are discussing? And I think it's worth, you know, mm -hmm. talking about. In, in setting up your matrix. Yes, I think it's a great suggestion yeah. also because it's real. All the other things are hypothetical, right? This is actually, I mean, well, it's more real than, <laughs> than before. It's somewhat, it's aspirational, yes, but at least it has, it has there's something behind it as opposed to um, the scenario framework that we've had to be working on uh, in the absence 
of of that of, of those INDCs. Alex, can you say how the timeline overlaps at all with the CMIP six and whether or not yeah. there's going to be any opportunities to use CMIP six outputs as part of the project, or whether we're going to be sort of limited to existing? So I'm I'm going to also turn towards Brian because I know you're you're coming up with the RCPs and remind me of the timeline. My impression is that 2016 is the earliest that any of the CMIP models would be running. Maybe some of them have already started, but probably end of 2016. Yeah, so I, my initial impression here is if we wait for CMIP 6 outputs to not only be run, but to be archived and initially vetted, we're going to really handcuff ourselves. So um, this is something I think increasingly understood in working group two. Uh, there was, this is one of the, the maybe 2020 of the IPCC. There has been at times rumors that working group two might be offset delayed to allow some of this to happen. Um, but at this point, you know, speaking as the climate, you know, hat on, I would say, you know, we probably are going to start this with a CMIP-5 approach. Yeah, the CMIP-6 plan is to complete runs by around 2019. Okay. So it, it could work out, and, and part of the idea is that some of the CMIP activities will just start right away, and they're trying to have more of a rolling basis. Historically, they're always ahead of schedule. So. <laughs> so it's possible that there will be new, you know, SSP-based scenarios done before then, but I wouldn't plan on it. Yeah, but having said that, I think if, if it would be um, highly useful for you to have <coughs> communication with them in terms of what are the AgMIP community's expectations, the yeah. needs, and so on and so forth, that they can factor into their ah, so experiment that, designs and planning and so on and so forth. I'm assuming that part is already in hand. So not only is that in hand, so I'm actually the co-chair of an advisory board that's doing just that, not just for agriculture, but for all sectors. It's called Vulnerability Impacts Adaptation Climate Services Advisory Board. So we just got word that we're officially endorsed by CMIP6. And the very first activity of this board was to look at the experiments and variables and say which ones we thought were most uh, and, useful. Right, and Provia is one of the founding bodies of the, uh, the it's called the uh, VIAX, VIAX, yeah. Yeah, VIAX uh, Advisory Board. So we, uh, I'm on the scientific steering group mm -hmm. of Provia, so Provia is sponsoring, but also is really, is really helped to facilitate it, but also Tajika, um, a, Climate services, Cordex, Cordex WGFC, um, the W, yeah, the, yes. the, the, the regional climate modeling group of WCRP. We all came together to yes. create the board. So yeah. it's we're it's exciting because it's also new and that there is this um, uh, really forum for discussion around these issues with CMO for the first time. Really, you just won the award for the most. Horrible. I'll put them on the slide for tomorrow morning. I'm not going through them all now. <laughs>